Welcome back. We have Professor K. Ramakrishna Rao to speak on consciousness and cognitive anomalies. And this session will be chaired by Professor M. Srinivasan. Also, in this, uh, no, I think that's the next session, sorry. So, uh, Professor Natra Sharma was educated at Madras Christian College, University of Madras, Emmanuel College, Cambridge, UK Imperial College, London. And at the Baba Atomic Research Center, Dr. Sharma did basic research in nuclear and high energy physics and on the enhancement of precious stones. He has published many research papers in physics, in ancient astronomy, and many articles on science and newspapers and magazines in India and elsewhere. It's always a pleasure to talk with Professor Sharma. Professor Sharma, may I invite you to begin this session? And also, let me also make a request that whenever you have a question, please don't hesitate to say at least what's your name and where you are from. That would be very helpful to others. Pleasure to come back to NIAS, particularly as Professor Srikantran is around. <clears throat> Let me start the session by introducing Professor K. Ramakrishna Rao from <clears throat> The, he's president of the Institute of Human Science and Service in Vishakhapatnam. He's had an extremely distinguished career. <clears throat> and so much so that um, it would do him a disservice to read out his credentials. One must just accept him as one of the leaders in the subject, particularly in parapsychology. So without any further delay, let me um, request Professor Ramakrishna Rao to talk on consciousness and cognitive anomalies. Uh, Professor Natarajan, Dr. Srinivasan, Dr. Sangeet Aminan, ladies and gentlemen, normally, <clears throat> when we speak about consciousness, the audience, the age of audience uh, is generally in the late 60s. And today I'm very happy to find a large number of younger people. So consciousness is no longer confined to the cortically control, no longer confined to those whose cortical controls were somewhat loose, but even among those of you who are fairly in control of your cognitive structures, still consciousness appears to be of some interest. I think that's a sign of things to come. My task was made somewhat uh, comfortable and less difficult by the very fine talk given to us by Dr. Srikanthan earlier this morning. The main problem with consciousness is that we just don't know what it is. Consciousness means so many different things. Not only people in different fields, but even for people in the same field. In psychology, consciousness means different things. In physics, consciousness means different things. In cognitive science, consciousness means something different. As uh, George Miller said, consciousness is a term which is worn smooth by a million tongues. Oxford Dictionary gives at least seven distinct meanings of consciousness. I believe Webster's has, as Prebrum said, 13 or 14 different meanings of the word consciousness. So the problem, therefore, in trying to give a talk on consciousness is to focus on what it is we are talking about. It's like <clears throat> God. Was it Coleridge who said after a long discussion, two people discussed about God and finally the gentleman said, well, your God is my devil. So what we understand by consciousness seems to be 
so different and therefore we find it very difficult to talk about consciousness in any meaningful, interactive way. I hope to uh, throw some light on this so that when we talk about consciousness the next two days, at least we know what is it that we are talking about, at least what aspect of consciousness we are talking about. In my view, there are four levels of consciousness. And I, here again I borrow from Dr. Srikanthan, there are different levels of reality. There seem to be different levels of consciousness. I find four distinctive levels. I will call attention to it. And you see, the meaning of consciousness significantly varies from one level to another. Not only the meaning, the semantics of it, but the methodology to study it obviously varies because consciousness in this, at this level appears to be somewhat different. The level of consciousness with which we are all familiar is what I call primary awareness. And basically, I think we can all agree that consciousness means some form of awareness. It is that in virtue of which we become aware of things. And awareness itself consists of two aspects. Awareness gives you information about an object or an event inside of you or outside of you. But also it generates a feeling, a subjective awareness of it. So first you have meaning, content, information, and then you have an experience of it. So these are the objective and the subjective aspects of consciousness. These are the intentionality aspect of consciousness and the subjectivity aspect of consciousness. By intentionality, we mean here consciousness is about something. It is about you, about this hall, about this book, about my feelings, and so on. And at the same time, that is very different from the experience I have. In addition to meaning, there is also experience that is intrinsically bound with consciousness at the level of primary awareness. When I see a rose, I enjoy its beauty, its fragrance. But at the same time, it is a rose. That is information content. So these two are very distinct and often we tend to confuse between the two. When I have pain my, in my ankle, is the pain I feel. But at the same time, if a, a physiologist might say, well, I can look into your brain and see it's the C fibers fri firing in your cortex. That's what happens when I experience pain. But can this pain be understood essentially in terms of a reduction of that in the firing of the C fibers in my cerebral cortex? You may depict it. Or you can have the thought experiment that has been often referred to. Mary, who grew up all her life in a hall where she has nothing but whiteness, she never saw any color all her life. But however, she was given all the information about the physics of the color. And she can tell you all that goes into having different colors, the spectrum of light, the physics of it. But does she know what the redness is in a rose? Can she say the beauty of yellow the sunrise or sunset. So these seem to be two different things. A, you have information content in terms of sensory modalities, and at the same time, you also have an experience of it. And this is called subjectivity. And subjectivity is first person based. Information is third person oriented. Consequently, you can make signs with regard to the information content of consciousness. But when it comes to the subjectivity aspect of consciousness, 
the quail, the feelings, the properties, the phenomenological <clears throat> aspect of consciousness, you have difficulty. So Chalmers said that the content part of it is the easy problem. The phenomenal aspect of consciousness is the hard part of it. But then there are harder parts of it. This is what I would like to call your attention to. In as much as you talk about subjectivity of consciousness, you are introducing the subject into consciousness. The subject refers to the person who is having the experience. Subject refers to the self which has the awareness. Subject refers to something that is an embodiment in some sense of consciousness itself. The agent of consciousness, the person, the self. And psychology, cognitive science, has not only difficulty in explaining what consciousness is, the query of consciousness, so the phenomenological aspects of consciousness, but it is, have, it is having even greater problems to understand who the person is. What is it that constitutes the person in addition to the experiences that the people have? This is an old problem. Buddhists have dealt with it 2,000 years ago. 1,500 years ago, Buddhistic thinkers, especially the Indian Buddhists, have talked a great deal about it. I will not go into it at this point, but the point is this is a perennial problem, a problem with which consciousness studies is unable to cope with. This, to me, is a harder problem than the phenomenal aspects of consciousness. The third is the hardest, to my view, and that is there are some aspects of knowing which this model of consciousness cannot simply explain. And this brings me to these four aspects of four levels of consciousness I call four P's of consciousness. The first I mentioned is the primary awareness, where we know that we know. And it has these two aspects, content as well as experience. And then you go a level below that. I call it paradoxical awareness. In paradoxical awareness, you do not know that you know. It is knowing without knowing. That's why I call it paradoxical awareness. Now, what, is, what are the kinds of phenomena that could be included in paradoxical awareness? which is awareness that is not recognized as such by the person having that experience. Unlike primary awareness, paradoxical awareness is neither accessible to introspection, nor does it have a subjective feel. It is paradoxical in that it is a kind of knowing without knowing. Subliminal perception is an example. To give you one of those crude illustrations, uh, it is said that they exposed subliminally coke uh, on the screen when the movie is going on. Uh, they exposed it at such a level that nobody is aware that the coke image was, uh, was projected on the screen. Uh, they found that during those days when this is done, there were more sales of coke uh, in the auditorium than before. In other words, somehow, this image that you have not seen was seen at some level, and therefore you are responding to it. A number of experiments have been carried out, some of the controversial ones, which include the so-called subliminal activation experiments, where uh, a, at, a, at, a, a, in, at an imperceptible level, a slide was projected on the screen for those who are undergoing uh, therapy, psych psychotherapy. Mommy and I are one exposed at, uh, I think, about 50 milliseconds uh, level. You hardly can see, except something is on the screen, but you don't know what it is. And they found consistently, not one experiment, the, the, the meta-analysis done on these studies, which came out uh, quite significant, which suggests that the people who had subliminally, who were subliminally exposed to this slide, mommy and I are one, were benefited by psychotherapy much better than those who saw a comparable sign, P 
people are walking. POW. In other words, here, information was not accessible to your introspective awareness. You do not know you have that information, but yet that information has an effect on you. Now, implicit memory. You can show the same thing. The person doesn't know that he knows something, but yet it can be retrieved in some fashion. And the same thing can be seen in cortically uh, patients with cortical damages, such as blind sight. A blind sighted patient, uh, when something is, exp uh, is projected to an area of the brain which was damaged, uh, he w anything that falls there, he doesn't see. Uh, but however, uh, you expose to him X or zero and ask him to guess, even though you don't see it, please say whether it's X or O. And apparently people are consistently successful to recognizing X or O when it is projected to a very highly statistically significant degree, which shows that these people have the awareness of what is being projected, even though they are not able to recall. The same thing uh, with regard to the prosopagnosia patients, same thing with regard to uh, people who, uh, who have hemineglect. Uh, these are the people with certain damage, certain kinds of damage to the brain. They say that they do not see some things, but you can elicit information from them which shows that they do in fact see. So this is what I call paradoxical awareness. So what is it that you know at the level of paradoxical awareness? Information content is dissociated from the awareness of it, which in the primary awareness, they go together. Information as well as experience. But at the paradoxical level, you have information, but no awareness of it, no experience of it. Third level, the third P is, is pathological awareness. And that is dysfunctional awareness. Most of the time we have awareness because it orients us to reality, it makes us to deal and adjust with the surroundings around you. It gives you correct information. But also sometimes you have incorrect, wrong, misleading, illusory, hallucinatory experience. And this is what I call paradoxical, uh, I'm sorry, pathological awareness, which you find plenty among schizophrenics. You find it in the cases of clouding of consciousness, pathological awareness. I don't have to talk more about it. And then the further level is paranormal awareness. In all these types of awareness that we have seen so far, somehow the information is coming to you through the normal sensory channels. There is a connection, a causal link between the object of your awareness and your awareness. But then there are instances when people seem to have information that is not causally connected. This I call paranormal awareness. Uh, at the highest level, you can say, just as at the lowest level, experience is dissociated from information, at the highest level, also experience may be dissociated, with infor dissociated from information. At the lowest level, what you have is only information. At the highest level, you only have experience and no information. This is the level of pure consciousness. At this point, it's hypothetical, it's speculative. But if we can believe in our own tradition, if we can believe in some of the experiences, mystics, saints tell us that they seem to have a state of awareness where there is only awareness but no information can get whatsoever. Now how do we know that this is real, that this is genuine, apart from the fact that they say that they have this experience? To me, it's very convincing, not simply because they have said so, but because this information, this experience seem to have extremely important transformational consequences to the individual. Once the individual has this experience, this individual is no longer the same person. There are total behavioral changes, total changes in values. In fact, some of the people who have the so-called near-death experiences seem to have a similar state of transformation. And therefore, 
If experiencing pure consciousness were to be believed, because it, for some reason, happens to transform the individual completely, I don't think we would have much of a problem in accepting that there seem to be something happening to these individuals when they do in fact report that they have achieved a state of awareness where they have only awareness but no content uh, of what they are aware of. Now I can go into uh, some depth about this but uh, I think our time is, is, uh, uh, is pushing me a little, a little harder. So let me uh, uh, simply say, between that particular state of pure conscious awareness and primary awareness, there appears to be another level. It is the parapsychological level. Here, the individual seems to have information that is not mediated through approximate sensory channels information that has reached the individual some way other than by a normal sensory processing. Now, what reasons do we have to believe? I will try to spend a few minutes with you to t tell you that there are convincing reasons that there is justifiable evidence to show that Perhaps some people can have information of this sort. Mr. Chairman, please let me know five minutes ahead that my time is up. Dr. Ryan, who sort of a mentor for me for a while, I happened to uh, uh, succeed him at his lab and, and ran it for 20 years in Durham, North Carolina. He had carried out a series of experiments at Duke University uh, in the late 20s and early 30s of uh, last century, from 1926 to 1934. I'm referring to those experiments. And of course, he had lived long enough to conduct many more experiments, but uh, I'm particularly referring to these old experiments because since then, a number of new experiments were done, uh, but the situation com continues to be the same. In this experiment, one of his graduate assistants Dr. Pratt, later Pratt, Dr. Uh, Mr. Pratt was the experimenter, and Pierce, who was a divinity student at Duke University, was the subject. They were in two different buildings. In one room, Pratt looked at, and he didn't even look at it, he, he had one card with a symbol written on it, like square, star, wavy line, plus one of the five circle, the five symbols. Which made, uh, which, which comprised of a deck of 25 cards. These were shuffled at random several times, and then they were placed on a table. And each time, at one minute, for a duration of one minute, Pratt picked up one of these cards, did not look at it, just held it, and then placed it in another pile. Next minute, he took another placed it, another file, and so on, 25. For a number of days, they carried out these experiments. As soon as he completed doing it, he wrote down on a sheet, on a record sheet, what the order of these 25 symbols were. In another room in the library, in another building altogether, about 200 yards away, peers wrote 25 symbols, star, circle, wave, wave, circle, and so on. And both of them, independently deposited a copy in a box, and then they took another copy for themselves and checked how many they got right. And it was found that uh, Pierce was averaging approximately nine hits in a run of 25, where the expected probability is five, consistently over, over, over a number of trials, pre-designated number of trials. I mean, it's absolutely impossible that such kind of a score can be obtained by mere coincidence. So you can apply mathematics of probability to say how improbable it is. It is highly, highly improbable that he could have obtained this information without having some ability. Now this experiment to me 
conclusively demonstrates the existence of what is now coming to be called ESP, extrasensory perception, or PSI, PSI. But then a number of critics have attacked this experiment. One of them is a Manchester psychologist by name C.E.M. Hansen. A friend of mine, in fact, we worked together. He came to visit us at Duke when I was uh, with Ryan uh, many years ago. It is in the early 60s. And I knew Hansel very well. We were good friends. And Hansel wrote a book, Debunking Parapsychology, Debunking Ryan's Experiments. And uh, psychologists generally refer to that book and what Hansel said about parapsychology and not do anything else. I don't know why, but this is often happens. Now, what did Hansel write? According to Hansel, Hansel envisaged the scenario where Pierce could have cheated to bring about the result. How could Pierce have cheated to bring about this result? You should have the, 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 the scenario is that as soon as he saw Pratt enter into his office in the other building, uh, this man uh, left his room and went to the ceiling. And then there he cleverly made a hole. And through that hole, he peeked what these things were when he was recording. And then he wrote them down quickly and then gave them uh, uh, to Pratt and, and to Ryan. And later on, he filled that place so that it could not be seen. There was no evidence whatsoever. In fact, the structure of the building, the way that Hansel had uh, uh, written about, was not uh, in consonance with the actual structure of the building because that building was no longer there. There were modifications made in that building. So he has to go to that level to show that somehow peers could have cheated. Why? Because this phenomena cannot happen. It's absurd. A human mind can never have information that is shielded from the senses. That is not inferential. And therefore, there must be some other reason. People do cheat. There is a possibility. But people can have this kind of information. It's not possible. It's absurd, patently absurd. And therefore, he said that this is probable. When you accord a zero power voltage to something, that thing cannot simply happen. This did not stop with Hansel. It, uh, the AAAS had a meeting to discuss some of the results presented in, in, later on by other scientists, many of them are in fact physicists, uh, who also obtained extraordinarily significant evidence in support of this phenomenon. And that the AAAS, of which the Parapsychological Association was also an affiliate member, And Dr. Wheeler was invited to that meeting. Dr. Wheeler was invited to the, Dr. Wheeler, as you know, is again a very distinguished physicist. At the time was attempting to, hoping to get a Nobel Prize. And he was, he was at the meeting. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you a story. This is a Lamarckian experiment being conducted by William McDougall at Duke University some years ago. The purport of this experiment is to prove that rats uh, transmit their learned behavior to their offsprings. And the assistant who was helping Dr. McDougall was able to push the button a little bit so that he got the results that uh, McDougall wanted. And this paper was submitted for publication. And Dr. Swinborn, who is again an outstanding physiologist, we had some questions about it. He happened to go to Chapel Hill and then went to Duke and uh, met these people and then saw to himself that this is how these re results are going to be produced. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, this is what Wheeler was telling, this young man was J.B. Ryan. And I was the director of the institute at the time. So J.B. Ryan was still living. I asked JB, JB, now here is this open statement made by Wheeler in a public forum organized by the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Houston. 
He said, this is patently false. And you kindly go through all the records. I have all the records. So I spent two months searching through all those records. And, in, and then we wrote to Swinburne. Swinburne was still living. Did you say this? He said, no, I never said that. In fact, my memory is, I find this young man is one of the most brilliant people. In fact, he was the one who was controlling for all possible kinds of artifacts from entering the result. In other words, Swinburne was attesting to the integrity, competence of this scientist who helped make the go in, who, in those experiments. And Wheeler was willing to throw blame on him as an unreliable experimenter. When we confronted Wheeler, Wheeler apologized, but not with the kind of greatness I would have expected him. He said, I have unwisely repeated a second-hand story. And his letter was published in Science, Science Magazine. So this is how people go to the level of disputing a finding because it is inconsistent with your prior assumptions. If we were to study consciousness, we must accept that there are four different phases. We must find adequate explanations to explain consciousness at these four different levels. Unless we do it, we will never be able to understand it. Fortunately, in India, Indian psychology has the methodology, has the concepts, has the categories that will enable us to pursue this field, which remains an anomaly in the West. That's why I have advisedly chosen the title Cognitive Anomalies. It is an anomaly, something that should not happen. But in our tradition, it is not an anomaly. It can happen because pure states of consciousness do indeed exist, and they can be studied. First-person phenomena can be scientifically studied, and again, we have methods to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me this opportunity. There's much more I can tell. There are 40 pages of this paper, and Sangeeta will print it, and I hope you have a chance to read it. Thank you. Professor Ram Krishna Rao. <clears throat> From what I had heard about parapsychology, I was a bit doubtful that it was one of those fringe physics things. But he sort of convinced me that there may be something in it. Maybe I should wait for the 40-page summary. Any, um, any discussion or any questions on this? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me compliment the speaker for an excellent uh, presentation. How do you relate your four P's model? Uh, I'm Subhash Sharma, uh, director of the Indian Institute of Plantation Management. <coughs> My interest in the field of consciousness is primarily from the viewpoint of its application in the management field. <coughs> So the four P's model, how do you integrate it with the Indian model of the four states of consciousness in terms of the waking and the dream, deep sleep, and the transcendental consciousness? First of all, with regard to your introduction that you are from management and interest in applications, uh, Douglas Dean and his colleagues at the Navarre College of Engineering carried out some studies on executives, business executives, and published a book entitled Executive ESP. They found that the successful executives obtained higher scores on ESP tests than less successful executives. Uh, in other words, obviously, these people appear to use some kind of intuitive abilities to take decisions uh, that uh, proved to be more appropriate for their companies. So, uh, possibilities of application. In, all, in, in terms of integrating with the, the Indian uh, theories and Indian ethos, this is something I was not able to go into in my, in my presentation of the paper. It is in the paper. There are two ways of knowing. Knowing through your sensory information, and knowing by being. It is said in the Upanishads, two 
no Brahman, if you truly know Brahman, you become Brahman. In other words, it is possible at some level, knowing is equal to being. And I think this is what happens when you practice things like yoga. After all, what is samadhi anyway? Where the distinction between the subject and the object is obliterated by a kind of unity relationship with the object of your cognition. And therefore, there is another channel for knowing, which is not the mediated channel of our sensory system. And this is what I call knowing by being. That is, uh, you access consciousness as such, or pure consciousness. In paranormal phenomena, you have that access, but then you have to cognitively process it. And therefore, it's a river kind, reverse kind of a situation takes place. And that is the problem which makes it difficult for us to have accurate information all the time. Any, any other questions? There's some young, young people here, right here. Yeah. Please announce your name and... My name is Ganesh and I run a, so, a small software company. Uh, does subconscious mind, uh, subconscious is almost same uh, what you talk about par, uh, production and all the stuff? Subconscious, consciousness, and superconscious. Uh, what we usually speak what, about. Uh, uh, these, these are uh, uh, these, these are different kinds of uh, uh, connotations. Now you can have unconscious cognition. Uh, that's what it is in some sense. Uh, you have feelings buried. Uh, below threshold of consciousness, as Freudians would talk about your complexes and, and, and so on. And similarly, a lot of memories were buried in your unconscious. And so that is one area of unconscious. But then unconscious comprises of much more than the forgotten memories and uh, th things of the start. Uh, if you are a follower, follower of Jung, the collective unconscious is something that's much more Powerful and pervasive. Can uh, one one or two of these conscious be at the same time? The one mind? one or two of these conscious consciousness be in the mind at the same time? Is it like you know I have, uh, either I am in the uh, normal uh, consciousness or in the uh, paradoxical uh, uh, consciousness or both can be at the same time? They can be both at the same time. There's no there are different levels. Yes, when See? you process information, you can process different levels. Yes, because, because while I'm driving. Oh, yes. I don't even know when did I change the gear, when did I put a brake. Very true, very true, very true. That, that, that's again comes under that. Thank Par you. Paradoxical awareness, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Please, two ladies, they have raised one, one. Give them two minutes. Yeah. Yes, please. These two ladies, yes. We are interested in younger people. By understanding, by what you quote, it's a couple of studies, and we've also studied that. Uh, in India, we have, as you said, we have the concept, we have the culture, we have the things to study. But how do we put that? Uh, is there a lab, scientific lab, where we can understand and uh, do these studies? Yes. Yes. Come to us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Ramakrishna Rao, for that delightful talk. Uh, I must stop further discussion on this, or, or else I'll and the eternal ingratitude from Professor Srinivasan. The next talk will be by Dr. M. Srinivasan. I've known Srinivasan for the last, since 57. <clears throat> he was an experimental nuclear physicist at the BRC for, for 40 years. He was involved in neutron physics and his contributions were to build the Purnima reactors, which were fueled with plutonium, which is a great advance. He says he played a key role in the Pokhran nuclear explosions of 1974. Perhaps, and this is my own view, perhaps this led him to change to fringe physics. But however, his talk promises to be extremely interesting.
Well, I would like to uh, come down to some ground level and try to convey to you. The young lady was asking the question where these uh, kind of experiments are going on. As mentioned by Dr. Rao, I'm going to talk about the fourth P he mentioned, the so-called paranormal phenomena or parapsychology phenomena. And uh, as again defined it as those phenomena wherein information seems to be transferred from people or places to a human being and vice versa by means not presently known by science. Since science doesn't understand it, they put it in a black box and call it paranormal. And again, from the remarks of Dr. Sharma, for example, it is obvious majority of the physicists particularly think that these things don't exist and that is all hogwash. But I'm going to describe to you today some fantastic experiments carried out by an experimental physicist. And since I was myself an experimental physicist for 40 years, I was very impressed by the work done by this gentleman by the name of Professor William Tiller of Stanford University. He was the head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And he had, it had been his obsession for 40 years to see if he can somehow try and understand this paranormal phenomena. And out of these has come some really fascinating experiments. And the work, even in his uh, career, there were two parts. The work he did up to the time of his retirement, which he has written up in the form of a book. And almost at the age of 65, 70, or whatever it is, when usually people retire and you know live on the laurels, he stumbled upon something fantastic. And the work he did during the period 1997 to 2005 is what I'm going to try and present to you. Believe me, it's very difficult. Here is, for example, the first book called Conscious Acts of Creation, The Emergence of a New Physics, which is based on experimental studies that he has carried out to try and find out a little bit about the mechanism of operation of some of these paranormal phenomena. This is the second book, which is much more simpler which covers the work he has done from 2001 to 2004. It's called Some Science Adventures with Real Magic. And this explains in a beautiful way the, the implications of his experiments and so on. But then my task is tough to try to present to you in just 15, 20 minutes. How do I switch it on? What he has achieved. Now, specifically, I'm going to talk about I had a laser pointer somewhere here. Oh, yeah. Two terms I'll be introducing, subtle energies, and in subtle energies, specifically a subcategory of experiments called psychoenergetic experiments. And in that, a specific experiment which he calls intention imprinted electrical device. Now, you will, as we go along, I'll try to explain to you. Firstly, what are subtle energies? Subtle energies, as some physicists uh, call it, are spooky interactions at a distance. Things like telepathy, which is mind-mind, clairvoyance, mind-distance, psychoenergetics, mind-matter, where there's no movement involved, unlike the Yuri Geller kind of experiments, where there is uh, spoon bending and so on, there's a slightly different name, and so on. All this category of experiments, which goes down to things like pranic healing, where healing occurs at a distance, and energy medicine, there's a new field which is picking up very rapidly. All these involve phenomena called subtle energies. For the benefit of those who are not aware, there is an international society for the study of subtle energies and energy medicine. They have conferences, they have proceedings, they have books, and so it's a serious subject of study in the field of science. Now, specifically the person whose work I'm doing is Tiller. You can get everything about it from this uh, website, tiller.org. You can download all the five-part papers which he has published recently. The first book he published was called Science and Human Transformation, uh, Subtle Energies, Intentionality and Consciousness, 1997. The second book, which I showed, Emergence of a New Physics, 2001. And the latest, 2005, Some Science Adventures with Real Magic, summarized the essence of his experiments and its implications. Now, one of the fundamental tenets of present-day science, what we call the 20th century paradigm is, that no human quality of consciousness, mind, or spirit 
can significantly influence a well-designed experiment in physical reality. This is the fundamental basis of science. All of us know this. And what William Tiller's experiment do is to question that. Similarly, it is an unstated presumption that the locale or premises where the experiment is conducted does not, cannot, and will not influence the outcome of experiment. We all know that, but the William Tiller's experiments seem to suggest that otherwise. In other words, at the end of it, this should have come at the end of the talk, but I thought I should place it in perspective. Essentially, what his experiments seem to show is the 20th century science of the equivalent of mass and energy. He has now extended to a third, third component, component, what is the energy and consciousness, which is what we call the 20th century science, or people have started calling it the third scientific revolution, which is to come. And I can assure you, it's going to take at least 20 years for science to really accept what he has done. But science is always reluctant to move ahead. Now let me come specifically to the IIED experiments. What is an IIED? It's a commercially available electronic device, an EEPROM. All of you know that, electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory, plus an oscillator circuit. In this particular case, it was 7.3 megahertz. Sometimes he puts in three oscillators in it. It has a rechargeable battery power, just like your cell phone charger. The whole thing is in a little box, 7 inch, 3 inch by 1 inch, like a video cassette. It radiates hardly 1 microwatt of power through the 7.5 megahertz oscillator. Then, very quickly, because I'll be using the word pH, most scientists are uh, chemists are familiar with it, but just to say, pH is basically the measure of the hydrogen ion concentration in aqueous solutions. As you know, water splits into hydrogen and oxygen, and it's the concentration of these protons. This is the definition of pH in terms of log to the base 10, etc. We don't really need to know that, except to say, when I talk of a pH of pure water, which is neutral, it is around 7, and pH of acidic solutions is less than 7, pH of basic solutions is greater than uh, 7, and so on. So when I say pH, please remember this is what I'm talking about. And also, another quick definition. A Faraday cage is basically made of copper mesh, just like a waste paper basket. It is a cylindrical basket, considered a fine mesh, about four millimeter uh, uh, mesh size, which will cut down the interaction of electromagnetic radiation to shield it essentially. So anything put inside that, uh, <coughs> very high frequency radiation is shielded, only DC and very low frequency radiation can enter it. So this is what I'll be meaning when I use the word Faraday cage, because he has used it in the experiments, I'll be talking about it. Now, specifically, imprinting procedure. Remember, the title was Intention Imprinted Electrical Device. What is this imprinting? The way they did it, you place the IID on a table and turn it on. Four accomplished meditators with decades of inner self-management practice sit around the table. He says in his experiments, they were all what they call Siddha Yoga practitioners. On a cue, they enter into a deep meditative state, namely an ordered mode of heart function, which most people in India are quite familiar with, what we mean by meditation. During the first 10 minutes, they mentally cleanse the environment, the room in which the experiment is being carried out. Then on a signal being given by the leader, they focus attention on the objects on the table to mentally erase any prior inputs from the device. Just imagine, the mentally, they're cleaning it up. These are all experiments conducted by physicist Edward uh, William Tiller, who was the head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering. He himself was a crystallographer, <coughs> published many books on crystallography, and so on. Continuing with the imprinting process, on the next signal, they begin focusing on the specific prearranged intention statement, which is read aloud by one of the four meditators. It takes about 15 minutes. Now, what is the intention statement they read aloud? I, I, I think it's given in the next slide. Finally, a signal is given to shift focus to a closing intention designed to seal the imprint into the device and minimize leakage of energy information from the device, etc. It's like sealing a letter. You put the letter inside, you seal it up with gum and close it. So mentally, they seal it. And after that, they wrap it up in aluminum foil. <coughs> Oops.
Now, the intention statement. For the water studies, the intention statement which was read aloud was to activate the indelving dwelling consciousness of the system so that the IIED decreases or increases the pH of the experimental water by one pH unit. Now, let me put it, what it means is they are essentially telling the circuit, I want you to acquire the power to increase the pH of water. Basically, this is the intention they have implanted into the circuit. Now, there was also subsequently, they discovered later, you can also have a different intention to activate the indwelling consciousness of the system so that the IIED becomes a powerful locale environment conditioning system such that any type of subsequent psychoenergetic experiment conducted there becomes successful. They had done other, you know, fruit fly experiments and enzyme studies and all that, I am not even going to mention about it. I will stick to the pH measurements for today's talk. Now, they have implanted the intention and let us see how they use it. Now, one of the things that they accidentally discovered was that even in the switched off state, some form of information leakage or transfer was taking place between the imprinted IIDs and other which are called control devices. You keep them on the table, go for lunch and come back or come after a weekend. Somehow the information had leaked into that. But they learned the hard way that if they wrap it up in aluminum and keep it inside a Faraday cage, this information leakage was minimized, suggesting that there is some kind of an electromagnetic phenomena to all this. But wait till the end of the story. Each device with a unique category of imprint, for example, if you say I, the, the one which is imprinted to increase the pH is kept in a separate Faraday cage, those in which it is imprinted to decrease the pH in a third Faraday cage and so on, are stored in its own electrically grounded Faraday cage. With these precautions, intention charge remains stored in the IID for three to four months. This is what they have experimentally found. After four months, the same device can be meditatively recharged. Recharging of rundown electrical bat batteries, etc., does not interfere with the strength of the imprint device. These are all things which they have found during the experiment. Now they have imprinted the device. How, are they, how did they use it? Experimentation with the in imprinted IEDs. The aluminum foil wrapped devices were separately shipped on different days via FedEx to their laboratory destination 2,000 miles away. On arrival, immediately they were placed in separate electrically grounded Faraday cages for storing. So as far as possible, they keep it in a, in a Faraday cage which is grounded. Now for the experiments, the IIEDs were taken out from the aluminum foil and placed in the experimental Faraday cage a few inches from the bottle containing the test sample of ultra pure, pure water. The IIEDs were then turned on and exposure times was 30 minutes to several hours in the experiment. Now here is the figure of the experimental setup. Here is a Faraday cage. This is a bottle of ultra pure water. It has a pH monitor, monitoring electrode. You have also a thermocouple to measure the temperature, the power supply outside, a 9 volt DC, just like a battery charger. The IID, ED, is just kept a few inches away from the water and it is switched on. Note how the electrical cables are taken out like this to minimize the, the cap is superimposed on the cover. Now the pH measurement can be carried out either simultaneously with the IIED exposure or subsequently after the exposure. You can expose it for a day or half a day or whatever it is and then the pH can be measured either way. Here are one of the earliest results, August 1997. Experiments conducted at Stanford University, the pH measurements during exposure. In this case, it was the pH, the, the intention imprinted was to, to decrease the pH. pH at 7 for the neutral water slowly comes down. Somewhere at this point, for example, the input on the device, the light input, that means the power supply got exhausted, but the pH continued to come down until it came here. At this point, the whole, the power supply was taken out, recharged, and then put back, it continued to decrease. So over a period of seven days, the pH came down, experiment for the pH coming down experiment. The, this is the pH going up experiment. Effect of placing an activated intention implanted electrical device in the proximity of 
a vessel of water. He is going up. Atrape water in the presence of IID, etc. Here is again about five days in this experiment. So these were the early results, but due to shortage of time, obviously I cannot. If you open the book, you'll see hundreds of graphs. If you open his book, it is just like a scientific uh, 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 textbook full of data. Now, since then, that was 2001, the first series of experiments were over. He got funding and the experiments, according to the latest book, he has repeated it seven to 10 laboratories, seven within the US, one in the UK, two in Europe. In other words, the charging was done in the US in his patient laboratory in Arizona. They were all shipped to different laboratories and the experiments have been repeatedly shown and these are robust experiments. These are not statistical experiments. This is not a question of one sigma, two sigma, but he has been able to demonstrate. But obviously, the critical step is the implanting procedure. If you and I try to implant this thought, obviously it's not going to work. Those of us who are coming from India, we know, we know about the Siddhis, we know about, for example, the Yoga Sutras and the Ashta Siddhis, the powers which you can attain through self-practice uh, and so on. So it is only those who, who have the psychic powers who are able to implant it. How much time? As soon as possible. As as possible. Well, I have to, this is just the part from the story, the tip of the iceberg. But what happened was, it is now 12, 5, can you give me 5 minutes? <coughs> what he accidentally discovered was when he started doing such experiments, the whole laboratory they found got charged or what he here got, finds conditioned. In fact, he later finds that this conditioning of the laboratory is one of the preconditions for the success of the experiment. So this is a sort of a, this thing. Now, typically, this is the period when the conditioning process has not yet taken place over a period of about six weeks, the conditioning, and after three months or so, the whole lab is conditioned. And what do we mean by condition? That is where the interesting things. Some type of conditioning found to take place in the local physical space. Conditioning effect manifests after some incubation period. Once the locale is conditioned, even if the IAED is removed, significantly different property measurements are continued. It lasts up to one year, the whole conditioning phenomenon. The spatial extent of the, uh, how long, when I say this lab, does it last up to the end of the building, end of the road, to the whole of IIC? It's about 50, 60 feet is what he mentions. Implies significantly stronger coupling with higher, higher dimensions of nature. That's what he has said. But then, from the experimental point of view, what is the meaning of the word conditioning? He has found specific experimental signatures. What happens? The water shows pH oscillations of a 0.25 pH units. <clears throat> the average was, let's say, 7.5 or so, but on either side, it, it shows fluctuation, but not in terms of high frequency fluctuations, which would be due to pickups and all kinds of noise. He's talking about a gentle breathing lasting over an hour. The pH gently goes up, let's say over an hour, comes down and goes up. So does temperature. So does conductivity. The ambient air temperature oscillations of 2 to 3 degrees. I'll show you some of the graphs in a minute. And <clears throat> what is remarkable in his observations, and for the skeptics that this uh, fluctuation is due to some local air, this thing he put in big circulating fans to churn the air in the whole room. Nothing affected those results. And these are the points at which he placed thermocouples from the roof suspended. This is a Faraday cage. He had thermocouples both inside and outside. And now here are some of the results of the fluctuations. And you can see all the thermal, in this case, four real time tem temperature measurements, one foot apart in the lab. All of them goes up and down in cohesion, in coherence. The shape is not a sine wave, so he went ahead, since he was a crystallographer, basically, he was familiar with Fourier transform. He did a full spectral analysis of the temperature fluctuation from each of the thermal probes. You can see the frequency components and the higher uh, uh, harmonics and so on. So it is this kind of measurements he has done large number and shown in since I'm running out of time, 
what he finds is that what seems to be happening is uh, it's partly speculation, partly based on the experiment, that consciousness seems to be interacting directly at the vacuum physics level, the zero point fluctuations level. And <coughs> it is this that seems to be altering the, the uh, properties of the system. And one last point, one remarkable experiment which has really helped him come up with a better theory, a, a theory is the effect of what he calls a magnetic field polarity effect. When he placed a disk magnet at the bottom of a pile of water, a jar of water in a conditioned room, when he, when the magnet phase with the north phase up, the system does not respond. First of all, if you place a magnet under a bottle of water, this magnetic field has no business affecting the pH. Anybody, any chemist will tell you that. But he finds that when he places south pole up and not rather the other way around, there was a significant difference. You see here, effect of reversal of magnetic field polarity, when such an experiment is conditioned, is done in a conditioned locale, this is with the north face up in two different labs, you know, thousand miles apart, nothing happened. But in the, in the lab where it was south face up, the pH went up and this gave him a clue as to what was going on. And from this point, it is only speculation he believes magnetic monopoles are being produced and all, from that he comes with a theory of how, I, I, is it an electromagnetic phenomenon? The answer is yes or no. It is, a, it is a kind of electromagnetic phenomenon but not the normal electromagnetic. He calls it magnetoelectric and he has given the whole theory of it and he has at the end of the book says, aha, I have now understood how this subtle energy mechanism operate. I cannot go more than that. My purpose is only to draw your attention to this very interesting work. And those of you who are interested, I would strongly encourage you, encourage you to go and download all the papers. Everything is available. He's a very careful experimenter, professor of physics. He has trained 300, 400 PhDs in his life. He knows what is the scientific process. Thank you very much. Secondly, very? Sir, let me answer that. He has done a hundred such experiments and he has checked the behavior of ordinary water over a period of six months using ten different pH meters. It's, it's all that's a journal of, journal of alternate, it is not published in physical review, but his five part paper is in the journal of uh, alternative uh, and complementary medicine. That is the only speculation. That I agree. Monopole part is his theory, he's a model which he's trying to explain. Just because an experiment is carried by a Nobel laureate or someone here, doesn't mean that he's a foolproof experiment. Right. Was it a double bind cross trial and it is done in drugs? Yes, sir. You can, that's what I'm saying. He sent the three cross word trial. That's what I'm saying. He, he sent his packages by FedEx without telling him which was giving the positive, which was the negative, which was the neutral. And at the other end, Certain things you must, you must give credit to a professor from Stanford University, head of the department, has done all that. So simple questions. Um, one sh very short question. It's all relevant to what he asked also. After I saw your abstract, I looked at his website, looked at the paper and looked at the data. Inadvertently or not, you have hidden the fact that the control experiment in which there was no intention planted. Right. Said, also the pH I have it in the next this thing. Also the pH increased almost the same way. Right. And then he changed his theory. No, that's I, right. I agree with him that these experiments were not reliable. He has not followed any scientific method in all his experiments. Right. Control, uh, the non-control. Right. The things where, where the devices were planted 2,000 kilometers away. Right. All those experiments. Right. The pH has gone up. No, but no, no. That's what I'm saying. No, when it was a conditioned lab. The point is, that's what he is coming to in the next so period. No, no. So the this is our experiment, sir. The control experiment has no value. No, no, but that's why. That, this is why. If you look at the scientific procedure, these experiments are worthless. See, in experimental physics, you, you, you discover new things and you have to change the theory. Obviously. Sorry. One shot. Okay. I, I have been in this field long enough.
I regret to say that I essentially agree with what Professor Jim Krishna has said. By the larger parapsychological community, these experiments are not taken as, as uh, establishing <coughs> what uh, Professor Tiller makes these claims. I would like to see Professor Tiller publish these papers in refereed professional parapsychological journals. When they go through the kind of review process uh, to be able to say that yes, these results do stand. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, he has not done that. So a lot of people ask us the same question, what do you think of Tiller's experiments? For me, it's like such I don't know, because I haven't been able to carefully see. And, and therefore, I would like you, at least from my perspective, to say, while I have great respect for Teller, what he has done, these experiments themselves are not conclusive. Can you have one last question? <coughs> One question. So now there are lots of research on uh, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and all that in parapsychological community. But uh, when we think deep and hard, uh, we understand that uh, whatever supernatural powers that are depicted in the Puranas and in the epic, it is uh, it cannot be overlooked or it cannot be underestimated as the research is going on. My question is: Is it possible to neurobiologically understand the awakening of the Kundalini or uh, tapping of the chakras? Not much is done in that, or is if it is done, where is it done? And uh, I think I should let the uh, Ramsha answer that. He, he is more experienced. In supposed to measure the activities of various chakras and he had provided some results which suggest there is something happening here. Once again, uh, I must say that even though Dr. Murayama is a very close personal friend of mine, he has not published in peer-reviewed journals right. and therefore for me it is only a suggestion that serious experiments have to be done. Okay. Um, thank I have a to to well, perhaps during lunch. Okay. No, no. Except to say, no, the fact, this answers one question also from your own abstract, just because a thing is not published in a peer-reviewed journal, I mean, not even peer-reviewed, by mainstream journals. No, I didn't, I, that was not my, my um, No, but I, because of the fact that the scientific community is biased, they have prejudged. Excuse, they will not accept it in public. Excuse William me. William Tiller is fighting a battle. Look at his Doctor. No, that I agree. You, what, the point you made? Dr. Srinivasan. I think this is okay. a fundamental thing. Okay. It's not the question of a peer-reviewed journal. It's a question of acceptance by the scientific community as evidenced in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, this is a long discussion which can be carried on over days. <clears throat> but in conclusion, of course, we all have doubts about such experiments. We have doubts, I'm sorry, say even about Ryan's experiments. There have been a lot of controversies about this. So as a, let me conclude by saying as a conventional physicist, if Dr. Srinivasan is correct and you're able to use Siddha to change things in nature, then maybe this information should be conveyed to the high spenders like CERN who would be able to make large hadron colliders at a fraction of the cost using paying merely six or seven Siddha meditators. With that rather nasty remark, may I maybe adjourn for lunch? Oh. I'm sorry, the lunch is not at ready. <laughs> we have one more session to go. But before that, uh, let me just tell you that I know that this 10 minutes is not injustice for discussion. So please write down your questions in a piece of paper and write down to whom it is addressed. And please give it to me directly. And we'll make sure that all the answers are given to you at some point of time. So please note that you have questions, please write down in a paper and give it to me and to whom it is addressed. We'll go to the next session. This session is chaired by
Professor Narayanan Srinivasan. Professor Narayanan Srinivasan is uh, interested in studying visual perception and attention, con uh, consciousness and computational modeling of cognitive processes. He did his master's degree in electrical engineering from this institute in our neighborhood, India Institute of Science, and the master's project was on EEG signal processing. During his doctoral work at University of Georgia with Dr. James Brown, he has looked into the interaction between attention and spatial frequency processing. He did his postdoctoral work at the University of Louisville with Dr. Edward A. Isok on diagnostic algorithms for glaucoma. The rest you can read it in the booklet. Uh, at, at the moment, he is at the Center for Behavior and Cognitive Sciences in Allahabad. Professor Narayanan Srinivasan, may I invite you to chair the next session where Professor uh, Mahadevan and uh, Professor Sumantra Chatterjee will be speaking. Okay. Um, the first talk in the session will be given by Professor Mahadevan on the conscious bacterium. So we are all very eager to know whether bacteria are conscious. Um, professor Mahadevan is a professor at Developmental Biology and Genetics, uh, Indian Institute of Science. He's a PhD in molecular biology and microbiology from Tufts and did his postdoc at Harvard. His research interests include regulation of gene expression in bacteria, microbial physiology and evolution. Um, let me invite Professor Mahadevan to set this up. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank Dr. Sangeeta Menon and her colleagues for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I have attended several conferences on consciousness um, sitting from the other side of the podium, and this is the first time I have dared to give a talk in a topic like this. And it's very clear from the talks that preceded mine is that we are on a subject that's extremely complex. Um, so one can have different views of consciousness, even the dictionary definition, something like uh, a dozen definitions are given by each dictionary to define what consciousness is. So um, what I'm going to do is to take a very um, somewhat narrow and simple view of consciousness, um, which is the ability, this is the physiological consciousness, okay, as uh, a biologist something that can be measured, something that can be detected, something that can be monitored, the ability to perceive sensory stimuli and respond by purposeful movement or by a behavioral change. So generally, when you talk about even this aspect of the physiological consciousness, this is generally uh, connected with areas like uh, cognitive neurosciences and intimately associated with the workings of the brain. But now, if you consider uh, there are organisms without a brain. So can organisms without a brain be conscious? Something like, what about bacteria? Now, I never really thought about this aspect before I was actually invited. Uh, and I have really no credentials to, to be a scientist working in the, in the field of consciousness. So I just looked back and what has been done and what is going on in this field. And I, this is an exercise trying to see if we can bring in some of these definitions of consciousness with respect to a prokaryotic system, a bacterial system that does not have a brain. And it's rather interesting that when you look at the bacterium, you can still use this as a model system to understand some of the fundamental questions that people, scientists working in this area, keep asking. Okay, so now there's a very brief history of microbiology. So if you look at the field of microbiology, during, I mean, it emerged in a, in a big way during the late 19th century, uh, and uh, it also continued its uh, impact in the early 20th century, and this is considered as the first golden age of uh, microbiology. Uh, primarily, the contributions came from the work of people like Pasteur and Koch, and in fact, uh, last year was the centenary year of the famous uh, postulates, Cox postulates, uh, of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes uh, TB uh, in humans and animals. And so microbes were considered primarily as agents that cause all kinds of diseases. But this view changed in the 20th century 
um, starting from the early part of 20th century, primarily through the middle of the 20th century, that when biologists started focusing their attention on microorganisms, study them for their own sake, not as agents that cause disease, but can we understand something about life by studying bacteria? Okay. And these uh, path-breaking studies ultimately gave birth to the field which we now call as molecular biology. Okay. All the fundamental life processes started being analyzed using the bacterium. For example, the discovery of the double structure, uh, double helical structure of DNA started uh, with an experiment performed by a biologist called uh, Griffith, you know, a phenomena called transformation, again related to pathology, pathogenesis, but ultimately he could show that something, an extract from a pathogenic organism can in fact confer the same property to another which does not have this capability. And Avery, McLeod, and McCarthy finally analyzed biochemically this particular factor involved in this and ultimately came to the conclusion that this material, what uh, Griffith called as a transforming principle, is DNA. This was the, the whole birth of molecular biology subsequently. Okay. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes from these kinds of studies where the microorganisms not perceived as an agent that causes disease but has a life of its own. And if you try to study this, you can probably gain better insights about the living system. Um, and uh, the first one, the work that I'm going to talk about, is the work done by two Nobel Prize winning French biologists, Jacob, uh, Francois Jacob and uh, Monod. In 1961, they published this uh, fantastic paper in the Journal of Molecular Biology, a very infant journal at that time. And this was a very important contribution, again, using the microbial system. For the first time, it could be demonstrated that you have a microorganism and you take that, and it has uh, this particular bacterium that they study uh, is called Escherichia coli, E. coli, that lives in our gut. And it's a common cell that lives in our gut. And it has this peculiar property which distinguishes it from other microorganisms that it can break down the sugar <coughs> called lactose that is present in, in milk, the milk sugar lactose. Okay? And the amazing discovery was that if you have the bacterium, um, and you grow this in a condition where you do not supply this particular sugar, and you try to examine the enzymes responsible for breaking down the sugar, you find that those enzymes are not produced by the bacterium. And if you now incubate this bacterium in a medium that contains these sugars, you find that they are synthesizing these enzymes. Okay, so this is a very phenomenal discovery. So that means no lactose means no enzyme. So the work first for the first time showed that now the bacteria have a system whereby they have the information, but this information is not accessed when it is not needed. And when it is needed, it can be accessed. So in other words, the work for the first time described a locking mechanism whereby you can lock up genetic information that is contained in the genes. And this information can be unlocked and used when it is necessary. But in order to unlock this information, you need the right kind of a key. And in this system, it happens to be the enzymes responsible for breaking down lactose. So lactose is the key here. Okay? So for the first time, you have a remarkable system whereby you have the genes involved in breaking down lactose all put together. And this is a famous operon model, where you have the genes all located in a contiguous fashion. And the genes have a doorway that's called a promoter. These are like three rooms with a single doorway. Okay? On the doorway, there is a padlock called the lac O. And on this padlock, you have a lock which is called the repressor. This repressor goes and sits here and locks up the room. So the access to these genes, information from the gene, is denied to the system. So now, in order to access this information, you need the, the substrate in this case, which is lactose, which goes and acts as a key, and the lock can be unlocked, and the genetic information can flow. The bacteria can now make use of this genetic information, make the necessary proteins, and uh, break down lactose. 
So this was really remarkable uh, discovery, and it still, even today, serves as the paradigm to explain how genes are regulated in all kinds of organisms. So the next is another rather interesting experiment conducted by the two biologists, two microbiologists in 1957, Novik and Weiner, which suggests of some kind of evidence to show that bacteria can remember. So there's some kind of a bacterial memory of their metabolic history. So these two scientists also made use of the same system, the lactose system. Okay? So now you can grow E. coli under two different conditions. You grow them in the absence of, uh, in the absence of lactose. You can give them any other sugar. So you call this as uninduced culture. At the same time, you can also grow them under inducing condition where you are providing lactose. So you have high concentrations of lactose in this medium. So now you can take these two cultures grown separately and you can spin the cells down and you can include them and start growing them in a medium that has very low level of the substrate, lactose, what is called the maintenance medium. So here it was high, this is zero and this is intermediate, uh, intermediate to low I would say. So when you do that, you find that this culture which was already induced continue to show induction. In other words, they keep making the enzyme, okay? Whereas now if you take cells from here, you put them in the maintenance medium. Even though there is lactose there, the lactose concentration is sufficiently small so that it is not able to induce the system. So what is now seen when you give this in the maintenance medium, the conditions are exactly identical for both cultures but they behave exactly like the way they were before this experiment. So in, addition, in, in short, they remember their past metabolic history. Okay. So now I switch gear and go on to another phenomena called bacterial chemotaxis. This is a really fascinating phenomena. Unfortunately, I mean, if I have some movies to show, uh, because of the restriction of time, I didn't have, but there are so many uh, good websites and you can uh, log into any of these websites. You can see these movies which show the movement of bacteria. Okay? So bacteria move towards chemicals that are attractants. There are many attractants. One example is glucose. And they also move away from chemicals that are repellent. An example of a repellent is a drop of phenol, uh, carbolic acid in the medium. And this is brought about by changing the frequency of what's called tumbling. I'll explain this in a minute. Uh, the process of changing direction rapidly, okay? And this phenomena of chemotaxis involves the coupling of chemical sensing system. The chemicals, the bacteria have a se system that senses the presence of chemicals. And this is coupled to the system that is involved in locomotion, that is a mechanical motor that drives the bacterium forward or backward, okay? So if you look at the normal let us start with a medium which does not have either attractant or repellent. And if you um, incubate your bacteria in this medium, they execute what's called a random walk, okay, or a drunkard's walk, whereby they move in any random direction, then they execute something called tumbling, and then they change their direction, and then they move a little bit. Again, they change their direction, then they move so this is a random walk. So if you follow a single bacterium, it will trace path exactly described uh, by a random walk, Brownian motion. There are so many examples in the real world which explains this phenomenon. But now, if you introduce an attractant or a repellent, the bacterial behavior changes, okay? So the reason why it changes direction uh, is primarily the locomotion is brought about by a structure called the flagellum, okay? It's just a whip-like thing that hangs behind the bacteria. So by rotating this in a counterclockwise direction, uh, the bacteria moves. So there's a motor assembly just be behind the, the flagellum that keeps rotating in the anticlockwise direction. And if the direction is counterclockwise, the bacteria moves forward. But if this switches its direction, it becomes clockwise, then it executes what's called a tumbling. So that is what changes the direction. From going forward, it goes backward in the other direction. So now if you have a gradient of uh, an attractant in that direction, what happens is that the tumbling 
frequency is reduced. So normally, if you, in, in the absence of any chemical, the tumbling, you can measure a certain frequency of tumbling. So in the presence of a chemical attractant, the tumbling frequency is reduced so that the bacterium moves uh, in a straight direction for towards the gradient. And if it crosses the highest point of the gradient, and if it starts going in the other direction, the gradient is now reversed, so then it executes a tumble and comes back towards the chemical. Okay? And the same thing happens uh, if, in, um, rather than having an increasing concentration of an attractant, if there is uh, repellent in this area in an increasing concentration, if the bacterium starts moving in that direction, it will execute a tumble and go away from the repellent. Okay? So here what is really happening is a very uh, elaborate sensing mechanism is present. There are receptors to which the attractant or the repellent can bind, and that binding is communicated with the flagella motor, which changes direction, either in the clockwise direction or in the counterclockwise direction. So this movement, this conscious movement, is brought about by this integration of the sensing mechanism and the response regulator mechanism. Um, so now I come to another phenomena called quorum sensing. Okay. Uh, as the term itself implies, this is a behavioral property exhibited by bacteria under a certain cell density. So what, in other words, you have a certain behavioral pattern that does not manifest until the concentration crosses a threshold. And if the numbers cross a threshold, then they start exhibiting these kinds of properties. Okay, one of them is called quorum sensing, and this phenomena was for the first time described in a bacterium called Vibrio fischeri. Uh, Vibrio fischeri is a common cell. It's a symbiotic bacterium that lives inside many other marine organisms, like uh, in this case, this is a squid, uh, and uh, it also can uh, inhabit other organisms like fishes, other ma marine organisms. And the interesting property of this microorganism is that it has components to emit light. Okay? This is a phenomena called chemiluminescence. Okay? So this is an enzyme-based light emission. So you have a, a substrate called um, luciferin and then an enzyme called luciferase. And when the substrate is acted upon by this enzyme, this is an ATP-driven process, energy-driven process, so you can emit light. And what is interesting is that the light-emitting property is controlled by cell density. So the bacterium, if you have a pure culture of this bacterium in a tube, and if the numbers are small, then they don't emit light. But when the culture grows to a certain density, they start emitting light. Okay? And this phenomena, again, uh, is a very intricate regulatory system operating. Uh, and the regulation is mediated by a compound called an autoinducer. Okay? So there's a certain gene called LexI, which churns out this compound called an autoinducer. The autoinducer, uh, one of the examples of an autoinducer is something called acyl homoserine lactone, HSL. And the property of this is that it is acylated, which has got fatty acid tail sticking out, so that it makes it easy for this molecule to diffuse from inside the cell to the outside the cell. Outside the cell, it can get into the cell through the membrane rather easily. Okay? And when you have sufficient concentration of this um, molecule built up, then it can bind to this receptor called Luxar. And Luxar in turn goes and binds to the DNA, and it can produce those enzymes, the proteins involved in light production. But the crucial factor here is the concentration of the homoserine lactone autoinducer. So when the culture is uh, number-wise, it's small, then the level of uh, HSL in the medium is low, so that that is not in a position to bind to the Luxar and elicit this response. So when the autoinducer builds up in the culture as a result of increased cell number, then you have this phenomena. Okay. So again, shows us that bacteria are not as stupid as they seem, but they have very elaborate mechanism to uh, respond to their own changes in their surroundings. They, they know exactly how many of them are there and then tailor their behavior. For example, it's very important in a pathogenic organism that it mounts the pathogenic response only when the cell number increases to a certain value. Because if they start, because the behavior changes, the kind of genes that get turned on 
once they are inside the host, they are different from the genes that are turned on when they are outside the host. But they want to turn it on only when the numbers are sufficiently large, otherwise they'll be gobbled up by the immune system of the host. So uh, sensing how many of them are there is very, very important as far as the bacterium is concerned. So this is, uh, uh, in fact, um, highlighted by the study uh, on this pathogenic organism called Enterococcus faecalis. Uh, this is, again, something that infects and causes serious uh, infections in uh, humans and other organisms. Some cases can be fatal. And it produces something called cytolysin. It essentially causes cell lysis, okay, which is a toxin produced. But again, this toxin is produced only when the cell density is sufficiently high. So what this pathogenic organism has done is to blend the quorum sensing system to control the other additional property of pathogenesis. And this is done in a very ingenious fashion. So the quorum sensing molecule in this case is a dimer. It has two components, the small component and the large component. So they come out as a dimer, and the dimer can dissociate and then they can reassociate. There is a certain association between them. But one of the components, the yellow component, the large component, has a higher affinity to mammalian cells. So if you have a host cell in the surrounding, this will go and bind there preferentially rather than interacting with this, which now frees up the small component. So the small component now can go back and cause induction of the autolysin, the cytolysin system. Okay? So here, the Enterococcus faecalis has gone one step further by making use of the quorum sensing system to sense the presence of bacteria, uh, sense the presence of mammalian sense cells in the neighborhood. And it's like a bat sending out sonar signals and then detecting the echo and then changing its behavior. Just like that by having uh, a dimery uh, autoinducer which can dissociate and one component interacting with the mammalian system it has an ability to detect who is around the bacterium. Okay, I'll, since I've run out of time, there are so many examples one can talk about where the bacterium has ability to perceive about itself and about its surroundings and change its behavior and change its physiology. So okay, the simple bacterium continues to amaze us of what can do and what, can it, what it can teach, even in complex areas such as our understanding of consciousness. I'll stop here for short time. Yes. Right. Now that is my qualifying statement. Okay. So that is my definition of consciousness, and I stick to that definition. And all my talk is geared towards that definition. But, yeah, but. But if you ask me whether. Uh, it's conscious about its change of behavior. I'm sorry. Is it conscious of its change of behavior and? Uh, all I'm saying is that it is changing its behavior based on what it perceives as its immediate surrounding. Okay. Sensation and uh, perceiving is not exactly equivalent to consciousness, right? No, that those opinions can differ. As I said I, at the very beginning, I made my case very clear that please, uh, this is my definition of consciousness, and I'll stick to that definition. Okay. Yes. I want to raise a basic question. The thing is that, um, is there any clear differentiating criteria between a set of responses considered to be, let's say, mechanical or automatic, and on the other hand, a set of responses or um, behavior of a system to which we apply the word uh, consciousness? So what is the you know, fundamental, I mean, to what extent is it a semantic issue? And to what extent is it a kind of conceptual uh, issue? Okay, so I plead my ignorance on this area because I'm not trained as a philosopher. But to me, a bacterium is a system. To most biologists, it's a, it's a cell. But to me, a cell is a very, very complex phenomena. Okay, and what happens, of course, the phenomena becomes even more complex when more cells come and aggregate together. But you can still study fundamental rudimentary aspects of what we call as consciousness. Uh, <coughs> Uh, <coughs> cognitive uh, neurosciences, you can have uh, a bacterial paradigm, just like the way you can study development, 
using a, a bacterial cell. Okay, that sounds like an oxymoron because development has to do with cells coming together and, and changing and exchange uh, patterns, um, functions change, etc. But it's interesting that bacteria serve as a paradigm even for development. Because I didn't go into one aspect at all. Uh, in the real life, uh, bacteria do have existence as multicellular communities. So enormous amount of uh, interactions. So they form these multicellular communities called biofilms. And these have Im immense clinical importance also. And those things are being realized now. Okay. That is happening. So. But even in a, if you look at the biology behind a reflex action, it's not as simple as it sounds. No, it's not simple. Okay. I'm not saying right. that any of this okay. is simple. I'm just saying that, you know, aren't we giving it some other meaning? Is it possible that it could be given another meaning? That is all I'm saying. Um, I'm not sure whether I can answer your question because all I'm saying is that you have a cell here which is able to discern what happens around it and able to modify its behavior according to what is around it. You can call it reflex. That was just an example. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry? advantages. Are certain things observed in bacteria? They are at immediate disadvantage, but at certain time in the future, this will compensate and they will be at advantage. Um, then it will become a more nearer to our consciousness, probably. Yes. Thank you for It is a mechanical. Consciousness can be defined in a number of ways. And uh, if we were to regard them as different levels of consciousness, there must be some thread that runs together from the behavior of the bacteria to uh, the saintly transformation I was talking about. So what, in your opinion, is that continuity that is across from the lowly bacterial behavior to the profound creativity exhibited by a creative genius. You know, I was essentially illustrating this as an example of how a living organism can perceive its surroundings, how that information can be transduced into uh, different types of behavioral but in as much as you say, this is your definition of consciousness. Right. That must it's a very, very rudimentary that form must of consciousness. To other definitions of consciousness. Right. So it gives you a paradigm to understand how cells uh, perceive information and how that information is transduced into fruitful or purposeful action. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. I think, okay. Uh, we're losing time. Maybe you can keep the other uh, questions. I'll be, I'll be available during lunch. Anyone uh, welcome? Okay. The next. The talk is by Professor Sumantra Chatterjee. Uh, it's originally from Santini Ketan, and he received his master's degree in physics from IIT Kanpur, then did his PhD in neuroscience with Terry Sudnowski, who's at Salk Institute. After his postdoc at Yale, he started his own lab at NCBS here in Bangalore. Um, uh, he's an expert on learning and memory and biological mechanisms, and he studies the brain. So, welcome, Sumantra Chatterjee. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me, and thanks a lot to Sangeeta for, um, you know, getting me into this trouble. Uh, as, a, as an experimental neuroscientist, you must realize, just like Professor Mahadevan, I'd be rather reluctant to talk about something I don't really work on. Um, a few years ago, when I first came to Bangalore, I participated in, in a similar seminar where I actually talked more about um, ongoing work in cognitive neuroscience, which was trying to shed light on 
sort of the neurobiological basis of consciousness, visual awareness, and so on, based largely on the work done by Christoph Koch and, and uh, Francis Crick, both of whom I knew pretty well. Uh, this time around, I, I prefer to talk about something which is closer to my own work. And so I've taken a slice of the question about consciousness through the sort of the window of neurobiology of memory, and then try to give you some insight um, into how such questions can be addressed. I'll be talking largely about two structures of the brain which are exclusively involved in learning and memory, uh, and hence the title. And I'll introduce these two areas of the brain with an anecdotal um, account of a patient um, who is the, the, the story itself, the case itself is more than 100 years old, and it is a patient of a, a Swiss psychiatrist, Dr. Edward clapper -Reed, who had this patient who was completely incapable of forming new memories but whose basic mechanical reasoning skills were intact, but beyond the duration of a few minutes, uh, she was unable to remember anything at all in her daily life. And this problem was severe enough that Dr. Clapperid was meeting her many times a day, every day, yet this patient was unable to remember him at all. So this was a very, very severe deficit of memories of facts and events in her own daily life. Now, Dr. Clapperid would have to come in every day and introduce himself to this patient and shake her hands. This, this is how severe this problem was. Now, Dr. Clapperid got pretty tired of this routine and decided to try something else one day. So he, he took a pin in his palm, and during their next handshake, she, uh, he pricked her with it. Now, uh, this is something I don't think you can do these days, but this is, uh, she, he, was, he was quite uh, desperate. And this was done in the hope that next day, when he came around, maybe because of this aversive experience, she would somehow remember her, him and would jog her memory. To his dismay and surprise, the next day around, the patient still had absolutely no memory of Dr. Clapperid or of anything yesterday at all. But when he tried to shake her hands, she refused to do so. And she remembered, somehow she had this subconscious sense of danger that shaking his hands is a bad idea. But she was unable to explain why she didn't want to shake his hands. So this is a pretty dramatic example where there's a complete impairment of her conscious access to factual memories, such as yesterday's events. Uh, she completely failed to recognize him or anything about him. Yet, at the same time, she had a very strong and acute sense of a subconscious memory of a fearful experience, that shaking his hands is a bad idea. So you, have, you can see that these two can exist side by side related to the same event. So this asymmetry in between conscious memories of facts and events in our daily lives and subconscious memories of fearful or stressful events in our lives, this asymmetry is something that I find quite fascinating, and this is what I study in the lab in a far more reductionist context. Now, now, after about 100 years of research, we now know that there are two brain areas which are critically involved in subserving these two contrasting mechanisms of memory. One is an area called the hippocampus, which subserves memories of facts and events. Another area is called the amygdala, which is critical for forming memories, emotional memories of fearful events. And much of what we know about learning and memory actually comes from extensive studies in the hippocampus over the last three decades or so. So I'll first introduce the hippocampus in functional terms. The hippocampus is buried deep inside the human brain uh, in the temporal lobe on your sides, in the temporal cortex, underneath the temporal cortex. And much of what we know about the hippocampus initially came from the study of one patient whose name is, uh, the acronym is HM. Uh, he's still alive. He lives in Connecticut. And the problem started when he started having severe um, epileptic problems, problems of seizures, which were in those days in the 50s were not treatable with anything uh, effective. So the doctors eventually used, uh, Dr. Scoville used a very, very crude logic that wherever in the brain the seizure is emanating from, originating from, namely the hippocampus and its surrounding areas, if we take that brain area out, the, the, the problem of seizures will go away. So it's a rather crude logic, but that's all they had. So they did a surgical removal of the temporal lobes of this patient so that maybe the seizure problem would go away. So here's an MRI done at MIT um, much many, many years later. This is a cortical, this is a coronal section of the brain, meaning in this plane. So here's, here's the cortex, and here are the ventricles. And in a normal human patient, you can see that these, all these areas in the temporal lobe are intact. And in HM's case, you can see the big black holes on both sides, suggesting, showing that those brain tissue, those areas have been removed as a result of the surgery. If you were to do the same scanning with George Bush, the whole thing would be black. So, uh, so HM 
had a severe problem. His seizure went away, so he was fine. His, his problem was cured. But everything after the surgery, he is no longer able to remember. He remembers everything prior to his surgery, but no new memories afterwards are formed. So he's unable to form any new memories of facts and events, even to his immediate life, nothing at all. Okay, and it's, it's quite an amazing um, a case. And here are some examples of what he has lost. I mean, he, even with thousands of reputations, he's unable to remember his doctors. Um, he doesn't know what age he is. He doesn't know, remember what he's eaten. Um, he still believes Harry Truman is the president of the United States uh, because that's when the, the surgery took place, which may not be such a bad idea after all. Um, and however, in spite of this severe deficit in factual memories, there are other memories which are quite intact. For example, if I were to ask you to trace between these two stars without touching either line, but I don't allow you to do that by looking directly on the piece of paper, but force you to look at a reflection of this piece of paper, such that your direct view to the paper is blocked, and you can only look at the reflection and then trace these stars. You're likely to make a lot of mistakes at the beginning, which is plotted here. But with practice over days, you will be able to reduce your errors. If you give the same test to HM, he's able to show the same improvement in this kind of procedural learning. But every time you give him the test, he's going to say, I've never done this before. I've never seen this before. So he has an improvement in his implicit procedural memory, yet no explicit knowledge or consciousness about having solved this problem before. So it's a severe deficit, but it's also a very precise deficit. And this, then for the first time, one could relate a precise deficit in conscious memory formation with a precise brain structure, namely the hippocampus. So that's what we learn uh, from HM. What about the other structure, the amygdala? The amygdala is a neighboring structure in the same brain area, and it's also buried deep in the temporal cortex. The amygdala is a critical structure for forming, uh, processing all sorts of fearful uh, experiences or emotional experiences, such that if you're walking down um, a forest and you see some structure in, in, in the woods, which may look like a snake, your immediate reaction, the sensory input will go directly to the amygdala over here, and you might just assume that it's a snake and you react. Later on, cortex and hippocampus and other structures might tell you more consciously, no, it's just a rope, and then you suppress your fear response. So this is, amygdala is a hard wiring of your fear, fear response in the brain, and it's cru crucial for our survival. Now, this hard wiring immediately leads us to evoking a fight or flight response, a fearful response, such as an increase in blood pressure, defensive behavior, heart rate, secretion of stress hormones. These are things we have no conscious control over. If we see something fearful, instantaneously, these, this response will be triggered. So this is a, a very strong example of what can happen with the subconscious. Now, this hardwired system can also be used to train your brain in the following way. Suppose in a, in a, in a classical Pavlovian conditioning, which you all are familiar with, where you ring the bell and you associate it with food, then you ring the bell alone, the dog's going to salivate. The same paradigm of Pavlovian conditioning can be used in this case in the following manner. If you start associating an otherwise harmless stimulus like a, a sound tone or a light or a color, and keep associating that with a noxious stimulus such as an electrical shock to your skin, then after a few of these pairings, if you just give the harmless stimulus alone, it will also evoke the same fear response. And this is called fear conditioning. Now, in there's a, a classic human case in, in New York, which my friends have studied, where, you know, so here, here's your coronal section again of the brain, human brain, and this is where the amygdala is on both sides. And here's a patient who has a congenital defect in the amygdala, says that she has no amygdala on either side. So this is one of those rare cases that, that came by uh, to the NYU Medical Center. And with this patient, one could do the same fear conditioning experiment in the following way. Every time she was shown a blue color, it was paired with a shock, okay? But every time she was shown a yellow, it was not paired with a shock. So then if you go and test it, you, you can test the, the fear response by just uh, measuring the skin conductance, for example, um, which, which goes up uh, in, a, in a fear response. And you can see here, when you give the shock alone, of course there's a fear response in, in a normal patient, in a normal human being. If you give the yellow alone, there's no uh, increase in skin conductance. If you give the blue alone, it has already been conditioned, and now the blue also give you, gives you a fear response. That's fear conditioning. In the case of SM, you see that the blue does not evoke a fear response. 
So despite this pairing, she's unable to show the normal subconscious fear response that, that's like you know, change in skin conductance. So clearly she has no subconscious fear response. But the question then comes up, the interesting question that is, does the patient have conscious knowledge of the color shock association? Maybe she's just unable to associate the blue with the electric shock, that she never has a conscious understanding of that. So in this case, you can ask the question, does she know that the color blue means shock? And because it's in a human patient, you can ask her this question. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you from a little clip. Hopefully the audio will work. She'll tell you. Notice that there's anything odd about my reactions to normal lifestyle, life threats. My fear element seems to be, to me, in my head, normal. I've never noticed anything odd. And um, how do you feel seeing these results? I mean, how does that make you? I'm dead. I think that it's probably absolutely correct. I know I don't sweat. Um, I knew that there was an anticipation that the blue square was going to, at some particular point in time, bring on one of the vault shocks. But even though I knew that, and I knew that from the very beginning, except for the very first one where I was surprised, I really don't think that um, it, it, I mean, I knew it was gonna happen, but that was my response. I knew it was gonna happen. I accepted that it was gonna happen. So I learned from the very beginning, it's gonna happen. Blue shock happened. I turned out to be right. It happened. Do you feel particularly brave or courageous or anything like that? I mean, what, what's... You know? So I think the answer is very clear that she has an explicit conscious knowledge that the blue was going to be followed by a shock. So this, again, then is another case study where there's no subconscious fear response, yet her conscious understanding of the fact this association is perfectly intact. So you can see that you can dissociate these two systems very clearly if you get lucky with a particular type of patient. So these kinds of studies over the many decades have given rise to a taxonomy of memory where there are non-declarative implicit subconscious memories such as emotional responses and motor skills um, on one side and explicit conscious memories that uh, were you know, lost in HM's case. So these can be divided and there are two structures underlying this. For the emotional responses, the amygdala is involved and for conscious memories of fear, facts and events, the hippocampus is involved. And these two cases give you a very graphic idea of how these things work. So coming back to my original question, how come then these two structures and their functional outputs go in opposite directions? And this is what I study in the lab, and I study at multiple levels, starting from behavior down to the level of synapses and molecules. And I'll give a very brief glimpse of how we do this. So I make use of the fact that there's an inherent asymmetry, as I've shown you, uh, between these two structures and their functional outputs. And behavioral stress is a useful tool uh, to study this because behavioral stress, exposure to stress, further amplifies this asymmetry. And the stress response of the body itself is under uh, contrasting controls by these two structures. So stress is just a tool to try to understand what's different at the cellular level. So at, and I'm now going to degrade down to the level of rats rapidly from humans and show you where these two structures are located. And a very quick overview of what happens at the level of single cells in the brain. Uh, here are two neurons. Um, uh, neurons receive information on what are called dendrites, shown here. And they send out their output via a specialized branch called the axon. So electrical activity propagates down the axon, reaches the contact point between the next, with the next neuron. And this contact point is called a synapse. That's where there's chemical transmission. The electrical impulse releases specialized chemicals called neurotransmitters, which diffuse across and bind to specialized receptors on the dendrites of the second neuron, and thereby trigger another electrical response. This is the basic essence of synaptic transmission in the brain. And what we first showed um, in, in, uh, in agreement with other studies done previously is that as a result of chronic stress, pyramidal neurons specialized neurons in the hippocampus, shown here, actually shrink dramatically uh, as a result of exposure to chronic stress. 
So the neurons physically shrink as a result of chronic stress in the hippocampus. But as a result of the same stress, when we look at the same brains and the same classes of neurons, but located in the amygdala, what we find is the neurons actually get bigger. So as a result of the same top-down behavioral perturbation, neurons in the hippocampus shrink, and that might explain why the hippocampus is going downhill, whereas neurons in the amygdala actually get bigger. So this gives us a direct cellular correlate of how these two systems might respond differently to stress. So that's the correlate we discovered first. Then the question is, okay, these neurons in the amygdala have more dendrites, but what about the synapses? Do they have more synapses or less synapses? What we found, so synapses, remember, are the contact point of information passage from one neuron to another. What we showed is that not only do the stressed neurons in the amygdala are bigger, they also have more synaptic contacts, shown by these little protrusions here are where the synaptic contacts are made, and we just physically count them under the microscope and show that these are cells which have more dendrites and more synapses per dendrite. So the overall synaptic connectivity of neurons in the amygdala following stress is grossly enhanced. So this is the correlation that then we, we found. And next question then is, okay, you have these new synapses as a result of some experience being formed in the amygdala. What do they look like? To answer that question, one has to use a different technique, uh, which is electrophysiological recordings. Here's an individual amygdala neuron which, from which we are recording with um, high-powered amplifiers. And the bottom line is we can now look at the electrical signature of these synapses in these neurons with and without stress. And to make a long story short, I mentioned earlier that there are transmitters which carry out synaptic transmission in these synapses. These transmitters have to be, happen to be glutamate. And glutamate has an op option of binding to two different types of receptors. One are called AMPA receptors, which are responsible for basic synaptic transmission. Another one is called NMDA receptor, which is crucial for forming memories. This has been studied in the hippocampus extensively. So you can think of the NMDA receptor as a memory molecule, okay, which is crucial for forming memories. So what we have shown is that if you measure the NMDA current with respect to the AMPA current, the NMDA current is almost doubled following chronic stress. So these synapses following chronic stress in the amygdala are actually far more loaded with memory-forming molecules, basically. That means that if these new synapses that are being formed have more juice for forming memory, then that might pr provide you with an ideal synaptic substrate for forming stronger memories in the future, even though the stress has been terminated. The stress happened for the past 10 days. We're measuring this after the stress has been stopped, and it suggests that the amygdala now is absolutely primed to undergo further potentiation and further emotionality. So the prediction from these highly reductionist studies would be that these animals should have greater subconscious fear. So I've given you a hint of what happens at the level of single neurons and synapses, given you a hint of what happens at the molecular level. We go back up to behavior where we started from and ask a simple question, do these animals have more subconscious fear? So to do this, we do the same experiment as we did with that female patient, SM. We first give a harmless tone, a sound tone, to which the animal doesn't respond, does not show any fearful response. It's perfectly normal. Then a day later, we pair those tones with electrical shocks to the foot, five pairings, for example. Then on a day later again, we just play the tone now, and these animals now have associated that tone with the shock and so they show a fear response. The fear response in the case of rats is a complete freezing, a total freezing response. So they just freeze and hope that the danger will go away, okay? So you just measure the level of freezing in these animals and compare them with unstressed animals and see what happens. So first I'll show you what happens when you give the five tone and shocks together during the pairing, okay? And that data is plotted here. I'm just measuring the percentage of freezing and the level of freezing. The higher the freezing, the more fearful the animal. And you can see that the control unstressed animals with the five pairing keep increasing their levels of fear, as you would expect, because more and more tones are being followed by shock. The stressed animals do the same learning of pairing, but do it much faster, because they have more of those learning molecules. So they learn it faster, which is what we expect. But they both reach the same level of fear at the end of this five-trial training, okay? And then 
we go 24 hours later to see how much of that memory do they retain? How much of the tone shock association memory do they retain? And what we have done, we've played a clever trick by reducing the intensity of the electrical shock to the point where the control unstressed animals, normal animals, after 24 hours, show a much lower level of freezing, meaning they don't really remember much about the tone being a bad tone. So their memory is fairly weak of the fact that the tone is associated with the foot shock. So this is just by tweaking the parameters. What happens to the stressed animals? Now, I'll show you a video clip where the unstressed animal on the left, stressed animal on the light, right, and a light, a little light will come on, which will suggest that's exactly when the tone is being played. So you now measure the response of the freezing in response to that tone, okay? So they're both moving around now. The tone is on. And you can see the animal on the right is totally frozen. It's just totally fearful, when it's the left one is going about this job perfectly fine. Okay, so I think this makes a very compelling case that as a result of a prior aversive experience, although it happened three or four days ago, the same fearful memory formation has dramatically different effects. One doesn't remember it at all, the other one is abnormally fearful. So if you now plot the same data at 24 hours later, while the unstressed animals are down here, the stressed animals show a much higher level of subconscious fear. Okay, and you can actually quantify this, and you can relate it to the molecular level. So this, we believe, then, is the basis for why, so these animals, previously stressed animals, because of the changes that have happened in the amygdala, the subconscious center of emotional information processing, they are really scared when they really shouldn't be. Okay, and this might also explain the behavior of certain inhabitants of the White House. So, uh, so with that, I will um, uh, end my talk by making the case that it's indeed possible to study some of these aspects of conscious and subconscious memory formation at multiple levels of analysis, starting from behavior all the way down to molecules and back and forth, provided the question uh, is formulated properly and you have quantifiable measures. Thank you. Like when uh, endorphins are secreted, hmm. do they reduce the synapses in the amygdala, and uh, is there a counter to the stress condition? As yeah, so a lot less is known about the amygdala, which is why we study it. I mean, we, we, the answer is no, we don't know. But uh, there are receptors. The amygdala is very heavily loaded for uh, opiate receptors in general. And in the, the positive side of it would be reinforcement learning. So if you, if you press, press something, you get cocaine or some food or something like that. That sort of appetitive conditioning also seems to depend on the amygdala and a neighboring structure called the nucleus accumbens, but less is known about the amygdala. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes, so we have, we have studied different stressors. This stress that we use involves a pretty severe one. You immobilize the animal two hours a day for 10 consecutive days. And they hate being pinned down, basically. We just don't let them move around for, uh, for two hours. That sort of chronic stress causes this change. If you, you can cut down that stress to one single episode of the same two-hour immobilization. And what we found there is that this one episode, and you can measure these measures of anxiety and things like that 24 hours later, and there's no, not much change. Ten days later, the fear seems to build up, and the synaptic connectivity starts to show. So some of these cases, it may be that you can have one traumatic episode. It might actually take some time to rewire the amygdala and show a behavioral manifestation. So the time course, and, and then some, once these changes happen, depending on the intensity of the stress, uh, they're not so reversible, which is her question. We, by the time, you know, the hippocampal atrophy, the shrinkage of the hippocampus, can reverse within seven days of this 10-day stress. Whereas we have gone out to 21 days after terminating the stress, and the amygdala changes persist. So clearly, again, in terms of the temporal persistence, the hippocampus and amygdala seem to be very different. So uh, this is one question. Yeah, this one. Yeah. What happened to you in the past, which makes perfect sense. 
how these molecules are being increased preferentially in the amygdala versus the hippocampus is what we're trying to understand now. That's the more cellular molecular question. Yeah. yeah. To your topic, um, it's like uh, we generally study the states of consciousness of uh, animals and human beings only from the neurobiological perspective. But uh, when we talk about the consciousness as exhibited by plants, as it is shown by the experiments done by Dr. Jagdish Chandra Bose, mm -hmm. and also the consciousness of microbes, say the talk given by Professor Mahadevan, they all uh, state uh, maybe lower levels of consciousness. So uh, is it that we have only evolved to develop a separate seat of consciousness, the so-called brain? And uh, is it that finally, when we look into the consciousness of plants and uh, microbes or the lower forms of life, is it that we can narrow down the seat of consciousness only to genes and not to brain? Or uh, if we understand the concept of consciousness from neurobiological perspective, how are we to answer the consciousness that is exhibited by lower forms of life? Well, I don't know which strategy, whether you want to first study lower animals and then go yeah, higher, and how start do we high relate and go low. Uh, even if it is done. The problem is that what I'm carefully avoiding here, you may have noticed, is that I'm not giving you a definition of consciousness at all. Uh, Professor Madhavan is more experienced and courageous, so he did that. I'm not even going there because I think the problem is that we have spent too many centuries fighting over definitions. Okay, so there's no point doing that. Is there something I can study experimentally? well-defined, and which will not at all shed light on all of consciousness, whatever that may be, but maybe a little snapshot on one side, one aspect of it. Build that up fully, understand it, let those experimental results help you build up the definition, and then come back to another experiment to negate it, to, to you know, pull it down. That was essentially what Koch and Crick have been trying to suggest. And this is a very mundane level of analysis. I mean, the people that are doing primate work, primate vision work, looking at visual awareness, attention, working memory, which are far closer to what we think consciousness is. Even there, it's just a piece of the puzzle. So the hope is as we build up the pieces of the puzzle separately, at some point it may come together, at some point it may not come together. I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that. Who knows? Right. Yeah. One last question. Yes. You stressed these animals. Have you been able to de-stress these stressed animals? Yeah. So, Two ways of doing it. Time alone, we have only gone up to 21 days and haven't succeeded yet. There must be a passive way of doing it as well. Antidepressants, anxiolytic drugs, yes, we have been able to reverse it, all these effects. Okay, so that's a pharmacological intervention. The other one that we're toying with right now is to do environmental enrichment. So give it a very rich and stimulating environment. So play with just the experience. Give aversive experience and then try to deconstruct it with a flip side of that. Those experiments are underway. And there's an interesting, uh, 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 the reason I'm doing this experiment is for a different reason. It's, it poses a contradiction. There's a large body of evidence in neurobiology which suggests that if you're in an enriched environment, especially in early life, the synaptic connectivity in the cortex is measurably higher. Okay? And the functional outputs of memory, other kinds of memory, are enhanced. So this is a long dogma in the field. I have shown that you can form new synapses you can same synaptic enrichment can happen in the amygdala, but it's leading to something bad. So is it wh which neighborhood the plasticity happens? Is that the question? So if you have good plasticity in a bad neighborhood, you're going to get more fear and anxiety. But could, could it be that when, once we try to expose these animals to enriched environment and see if the fear goes down behaviorally, would that mean that the spines would go down? That's the contradiction because the rest of neuroscience is telling us enriched environment will give you more synapses. So that's the reason we're doing this experiment to see if the fear goes down, will the synapses go down in the amygdala, which will suggest that the rule of whether you form or collapse a synapse in the amygdala as a result of enriched environment might be fundamentally different. If that's the case, there might be a genetic basis for that also. So we, we actually, we just started this experiment last week. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Professor, uh, uh, you have said that Obviously, when we go to the level of rats and so on, we're talking about implicit rather than explicit memory. But uh, uh, I would like to see what kind of a sense we can make out of the whole thing uh, in terms of what is it that mediates it into our 
let's use the word conscious awareness. Right. Uh, in other words, not only we are afraid, but we know we are afraid. Right. So now there are, as I understand it, there are three different kinds of uh, um, theories that uh, appear to account for how this awareness is mediated. One of them, I'm sure you are aware of Daniel Schechter's model, DICE model, uh, where a separate module is postulated right. to mediate awareness. And then you have Kinsborn and others who say it is not any single module, but the whole system itself uh, produces it. The third model is that uh, it's a continuum. At the end of the continuum, you have awareness, and at the beginning, you don't. To which one of these, from your own studies, do you prefer? Which of these models? Right. So uh, let me just uh, um, qualify a statement. The, the issue of explicit memory, memory of facts and events, the reason I did not talk about it today is that that's the most extensively studied and well understood. And the hippocampus has been you know, clearly implicated all the way down to the genetic level in terms of explicit memory formation of facts and events, even in animals. So in rats, we study spatial learning. Where is, there, you know, where is food hidden and things like that. So that is rather well understood. What is less well understood is the amygdala and other areas. Okay, so then the question comes, for example, in the hippocampus with uh, HM, um, or other such studies, uh, long-term recollection of older memories before the surgery is not impaired, okay, of the same kind, factual memory, which suggests that the memory is not being stored in the hippocampus. It has to be stored somewhere else. And those experiments, subsequent experiments have shown that about three to four weeks after the acquisition of information, you no longer need the hippocampus. So it's clearly going to cortex. But cortex is a large neighborhood. So where do you go looking for it? The, the, clear, the simplest answer is that it's sensory modality specific. So if there's a visual, largely visual memory, it will probably reside in higher visual cortical areas versus somatosensory and so on. So if I say that that's the first step of storage, long-term storage, and that storage is now being understood in structural and molecular terms, then the question comes up, uh, a memory is not just one sensory modality. It has sound, light, everything, smell together. So how do you bind it together? That's the classic binding problem that Pat Churchland and, and Craig and others have fought with. And there, the suggestion is that large-scale oscillations sweeping the cortex in the higher frequency, like 40 hertz, may be you know, synchronizing multiple areas. That also doesn't satisfy me, because then the question, memory formation only half the story. The other half is how do you recollect? If you can't remember something, that memory is just as well as no good. Right? So how do you recollect? And large part of the research that's going on right now doesn't address that. We have no way of understanding, if I make this synapse change, how the hell do that, does that synapse know that it has to recall its molecular memory when 10 years later an input comes in which is similar? So that part of our understanding is the least pro, you know, advanced right now. And so I think that's, that's where it largely stands. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I think we need to go for lunch. I'd um, like to thank both Professor Mahadevan and Professor Chatterjee for the wonderful presentations. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think you want to make it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Narayanan, uh, Dr. Mahadevan, and uh, Dr. Sumandra. Uh, just a brief announcement. Uh, as I said in the morning, Jean Letchert uh, should have been here with us today. Uh, his, he had got a minor stroke uh, last week, and unfortunately, he will not be able to join us, and he asked me to convey his apologies to you. So what we can do is, in that half an hour, uh, we have equally interesting people who are the registered participants. So we can spend that half an hour, each of the registered participants spending maybe half a minute or say, so, saying who they are. So we could spend half an hour doing that because we wouldn't like to shift the whole sessions upward because there are a few people who have just coming to listen to come some of this. So if you shift it up, you know, I will not be doing a fair job to those people. So we will, we will just follow the same schedule, but please be back if possible by 2 or at least 2.10 and then we will know who are the people, very interesting people who are listening all this while. Thank you. <laughs>